G3 Assistance through Virginia's community colleges is your pathway to a new future, helping those who qualify pay for school and train for the right career. Right where you are, right now. Get a skill, get a job, get ahead. You can learn more at vccs.edu forward slash G3. This is a CBC Podcast. There is a lot of uncertainty facing New Brunswick's health care system. Nursing shortages, doctor recruitment, and short-term closures of hospital units all pose significant challenges, not to mention the pandemic and the recent increase in COVID infections. And that's a lot for the interim president and CEO of Horizon Health. Dr. John Dornan joins me this morning. Dr. Dornan, good morning to you. Good morning, Rachel. You're stepping into the role of former CEO Karen McGraw, uh, who was not expected to retire until this coming January. What can you tell us about her early departure? Well, um, you know, Ms. McGraw uh, spent, I'll say, uh, probably more than any other uh, CEO uh, at the helm in Horizon, more time. And, uh, you know, did a lot of uh, very good work with us, leadership, uh, instituted programs, and really set the tone for some of the things that we are moving towards. So uh, Ms. McGraw had a discussion with uh, the minister um, earlier this month and decided that uh, collectively she would uh, she would retire. She was retiring from Horizon uh, within a few months regardless. And my understanding uh, from, from Ms. McGraw and the uh, minister is that the plan was to set a stage so that we would have um, a new CEO and president in the not too distant future, and uh, they decided that uh, Ms. McGraw would would leave at this time. Uh, she has made plans for her retirement, and, and we're glad to support her in that context. And what can you tell us about what happened next? How did you end up taking this role? Well, um, earlier this week, uh, we became aware that Ms. McGraw was uh, was leaving, and um, and I think that. Well, I was approached by um, the Minister of Health and, and, and her colleagues to, to consider um, taking on this role on an interim basis. And so uh, I, uh, I, I am willing to help in this context, and I feel capable. I have a, a, a fair amount of familiarity with healthcare in New Brunswick. And so uh, I was approached if I would take this on on an interim basis, and I'm certainly willing to do that. You, for many years, you've held leadership positions. So the question is not about whether you can, but why you would, Doctor Dornan. Well, you know, I take um, I take a lead from our from our nursing staff. You know, when there's when there's trouble in healthcare with patients on our floors, uh, our nursing staff does not back away. They they charge. Um, toward the problem. And I feel of a similar mindset. Uh, you know, when there's been problems in healthcare, um, in my hospital, in our region, in New Brunswick, uh, when given an opportunity to, to help out, uh, I, I move forward. And frankly, I do it with um, the help of colleagues. I have never worked on a problem that hasn't been solved by my colleagues. And this is really throughout New Brunswick, and it's um, something that I, I, I'm honored to be able to do. So many pressing issues uh, in the time that you have, uh, I should ask, how long do you think he'll do, be doing it? Well, this I don't know. Uh, there is a process for the selection of a full-time president and CEO, and that process continues. Uh, I understand that there are interviews for uh, very um, very valid candidates for this job, and I don't know how long that will take. Uh, I know that uh, the process is looking at uh, individuals from outside the province, from within the province, Sometimes it's a matter of uh, leaving an old position, whether it's inside the province or outside the province, and making time and space and plans for a new job. So I don't know how long that could take. Um, you know, it won't be a year. Uh, so I anticipate being in an interim capacity for weeks or months. What do you think will be your priorities in the time that you have? Well, Rachel, it's a, it's a very good question, and um, and 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 I I live our. Um, our emergencies, you know, day by day. And our priorities, I believe, our emergency medicine, uh, we're overwhelmed uh, by the number of people that are coming into emergency care more than ever before. But that's coupled with uh, a nursing shortage. And the fewer nurses you have, 
the harder it is on those that remain, and they are subject to uh, the stress of the workplace, burnout, and then and they're inclined to at times seek early retirement or uh, um, you know other alternatives in terms of uh, jobs and things like this. So this is a re- this is a tremendous crisis. We've seen it with physicians, with nurses, and other healthcare workers. We need to uh, do our best to change the environment so that it's more acceptable for the nurses that are working there to stay working there. Once we do that, then we will be able to recruit into these positions. And so it's linked, the number of people that are coming to our emergency department, the resources there, and as well our nursing crisis, our nursing, a safe environment for our nurses. Mm -hmm. And we heard that from the Medical Society in their report earlier this week. Um, But to the point on the emergency room, is there something in particular that's, why is it so overwhelmed right now? Well, uh, the emergency department is the go-to place for people that have high acuity problems, you know, heart attacks, um, uh, strokes, uh, trauma, and the like. But as well, in many of our communities, uh, the emergency department has become a source of primary care. And this is partly because uh, folks don't know other points of access to health care. And for example, we are encouraging uh, patients to, to look at other venues. For example, uh, their family doctors, after-hours clinics, uh, pharmacists, nurse practitioners. Um, there's a lot of other venues that people could consider. And so we are going to work with the medical society and doctors to explore what we can do to improve access to primary care outside of the emergency department. So that is, um, a, 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 I say, a direction that has happened over the last decade. And so we need to work with our partners to look at uh, other alternatives. A moment ago, you were speaking about the nursing shortage. Not having enough nurses means those who who are working are working more and experiencing um, stress, perhaps, and burnout. And then, meanwhile, you see hospitals doing things like closing units in the Upper River Valley and Sackville and Campbellton. Like, what would you consider to provide staff with some reprieve? Well, that's a very good question. We have um, people that are in hospital sometimes longer than is absolutely necessary. And what we need to do is be more efficient with the care that we give in our hospitals, manage our resources, uh, let's say differently, so that people are coming in and receiving their treatment and going back home in a very reasonable period of time, a way that doesn't have them coming back because care is incomplete, but not spending more days in hospital than is necessary. So it's all very much linked. If we can reduce the in-hospital burden make it a safer, uh, more tolerable places for our physicians and nurses, then that becomes a more attractive floor. We also uh, free up room for patients that are in our emergency departments that have actually been admitted but are um, receiving their care in the emergency department, which is not, 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 a, not a optimal. So if we can get those people up to the floor, get people that are on the floors uh, home, uh, to extramural hospital, to other resources, then, um, uh, you know, it sounds like a naive solution, but it's where we have to start. And my plan would be to talk to our uh, directors of inpatient care, as well as our emergency room leaders, and they have tons of good ideas. And uh, so I'm looking forward to working with that group. Where does the pandemic fit right now into your concerns? What's top of mind? Well, the pandemic um, is an overlay on everything we do. You know, we watch uh, infectious rates daily. We do our best to mitigate or prevent uh, people from getting infections in hospitals, for example. And, um, you know, it's a a constant umbrella over everything we do. When someone comes to the emergency department that, let's say, has chosen not to be vaccinated, we have to treat them differently than those that have been fully vaccinated. And, And that's an extra stress, an extra burden on our resources. So if I can make an appeal through, through you, Rachel, is that if people would get vaccinated when they come in, uh, then we are better able to handle them, handle their emergency needs than if they have chosen not to be vaccinated. And so, so that already increases our uh, demand, those that haven't been vaccinated. And as well, even in the context of those that have been vaccinated, we know that that's not an absolute um, tool to prevent 
having the COVID. So, so with the COVID, uh, fortunately at this level, uh, when folks get it, they, and they have been vaccinated, for example, or if they haven't been vaccinated, they, they don't seem to get it as severely. So our hope is that with the rising numbers in our community, that that does not translate into an increasing in numbers of patients that are admitted to our hospitals. Thus far, there's been four, and those um, are, they have a higher demand than someone that doesn't have COVID in terms of separation, um, distancing, gloving, gowning, uh, goggles, and the rest. So, so COVID is a, is a factor that has put additional stresses on our resources, and then that's coming together at the same time as the, um, as the nursing crisis. You described some of the PPE, the the protective measures that staff have to go through. It's really hard to imagine what that has been like month in and month out. Uh, We at CBC News obtained a memo earlier this month that raised concerns that Horizon employees and physicians were not following the COVID-19 safety rules What is your experience with that? Is, is, Is that a result of fatigue? Well, I could, uh, I'm glad you've asked this question because the memo went out as a, as a reminder. It wasn't that our staff were doing poorly. In fact, uh, we review this on a weekly and daily basis, the, the compliance with um, masking, hand washing, social distancing. And throughout New Brunswick and all our hospitals in Vitality and Horizon, uh, they are following procedure. You know, might someone walk through a door and forget um, for a minute that they haven't washed their hands on the entrance, yes, very rarely, uh, less than uh, 0.02%. So, so the memo went out. It was a routine reminder like we would do for many other processes. It did not mean that uh, our staff weren't following protocol. One more topic I want to talk to you about is, is recruitment of doctors. Again, the, the New Brunswick Medical Society raised it earlier this week. They say they've got pages of how to go about fixing this. The province, with some controversy, has said they'll step in. What, where do you think the answers will come from? Well, I, I'm very confident, Rachel, that it's all players on deck. And that means the medical society. It means um, leaders and departments that know their needs and who out there could come to help us. It means us as Horizon, our recruitment team, um, and it means, frankly, people in the community that know of doctors that are looking for work. So so we are working collaboratively. Um, I think we've been frustrated at times where there are holes in our, our nursing group and our physician group. And, you know, we want, we want people to fill these positions yesterday. So we are working collaboratively, really, with, with government, with the medical society. And I'll be frank, uh, the medical society has come up with some very good uh, ideas about how we could recruit physicians. They published a paper this week, and, uh, and I've had an opportunity to speak with uh, folks in government and certainly people in my own shop about how we will um, continually improve this process. You know, we, we have uh, physician recruiters that work at this day and night, and, you know, I get emails from folks uh, on weekends, after hours, uh, that, that tell me about opportunities and how we can make it better for a given person. Uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons is a, a player here in terms of ensuring that people have their proper credentials and licensing. And our nursing leads as well look at getting good nurses uh, throughout the country, throughout the province, throughout the world. And so we are, we are moving forward in that respect. Dr. Dornan, thank you for making this time for us. You're welcome, Rachel. Thank Have you. a good day. You too now. Bye-bye. Bye. Dr. John Dornan is the new acting president and CEO of Horizon Health Network. He stepped into the role uh, Wednesday following the early retirement of Karen McGraw. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.